If we think about the early days of home computers, they were quite versatile. There was so much you could do with them. You could play games, run business or educational software, with a modem dial into a bulletin board service. You could compose and play music, and of course, learn how to program on one. Computers inherently are an open platform, but tapping into and hitting the hardware can be complex, unless you have a knowledge of the target hardware, understand machine code, how the memory and devices are accessed, it can take some skill. Fortunately, many of the earliest microcomputers for the home came with manuals. These manuals would teach you how to program the machine. It's a good thing because in many cases, as soon as you turn the machine on, you would be greeted with a blinking cursor, waiting for you to key in instructions. Later on, during the 16-bit era, the blinking cursor was replaced with a desktop graphical user interface. But almost every microcomputer from that era would come bundled with a language known as Beginner All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code, or BASIC. The concept of BASIC was for ease of use. If you wanted to learn how to program a computer, BASIC was your gateway. BASIC opened up computing to students that were in other areas of expertise. For example, a student could easily write code to solve math problems without inherent knowledge of the language. It also used line numbers so you could keep track of the code and what it was doing. In effect, you were learning about programming without even realizing. To illustrate this, let's take a look at the classic Hello World Basic program. As you know, it looks something like this. Now let's consider the equivalent piece of code that was written in C. So why is this interesting? The basic program running is in a simple loop, which is an important principle when it comes to writing code. The go-to statement makes it obvious to understand. You want the program execution to go back to line 10 and print Hello World again. But if you're not a programmer, you may not be familiar with what a loop is. BASIC teaches you this without really understanding the concept. It's easy to follow along with the line numbers and one of the most compelling reasons why it's so easy to pick up and learn. The first home computer version of BASIC was written by Microsoft, specifically Bill Gates and Paul Allen, which was ported to many other systems. And there would be around 30 variants of Microsoft BASIC designed for many different home computers. As you can imagine, Microsoft BASIC on just about every home micro of the era would make Microsoft a lot of money in licensing, and it really set up the business for things to come. Although the basic programming language is considered to be portable, in quite a few cases that was never really true. You see, if you wanted to take advantage of the target machine's graphics, sound or disk I.O., there would need to be custom basic commands to do that. So you couldn't just, for example, take a Commodore 64 basic program and run it on Amiga basic. You would need to port it over. BASIC also is not a fast language. Each line of code is interpreted by the machine on the fly. This is not particularly fast as compared to a compiled language like C. This also meant that the early 8-bit home computer micros, say something like the Commodore 64, that only has a 1 MHz CPU, meant that BASIC was simply not an option. To squeeze as much performance out of the machine required access to the bare metal, and coders usually resorted to assembly language or machine code. With the next generation of the Amiga, Atari ST and IBM PC, it meant better and faster hardware, access to more memory, faster graphics and more. But the same problem existed. BASIC was slow and clunky. Over on the IBM PC since 1985, Microsoft developed Quick Basic, which was quite popular. It was based on the earlier GW Basic, but it had a dedicated integrated development environment or IDE, and it even had a compiler. The problem with BASIC was, it wasn't great for making games. This would mean that you would need to learn and understand Turbo Pascal, C or assembly language and have some intimate knowledge of the hardware, otherwise game development would be tricky to learn. Over on the Amiga, Amiga BASIC by Microsoft came with the operating system. It was also very slow because it wasn't very well optimized. But sometime in the late 80s, game development studios decided upon themselves to come up with their own solutions. Notably, Europress software for Amos BASIC on the Amiga or STOS BASIC on the Atari ST, and Acid Software who developed Blitz BASIC. Both Amos and Blitz were capable enough to run fast code. Certainly not as fast as optimized assembly, but it was good enough for most. 
Commercial games such as Super Skid Marks and more notably Worms by Team 17 in 1995 was an absolute smash hit and a game that is still very much relevant in 2020. Worms was developed originally with Blitz Basic. In 1983, Sega released its first and only home computer, the SC3000. The computer was also known as the Sega Computer, a very typical 8-bit micro from the era. It featured an NEC D780, which is a clone of the Xilog Z80 running at 3.5 MHz, a 256 by 220 resolution graphics mode up to 16 colors from a 256 color palette, and it also featured 6-channel audio thanks to the Texas Instruments SN076596 PCM sound chip. The SC3000 also came bundled with Sega Basic, and later on Home Basic was an add-on cartridge. Both Sega and Home Basic was developed by MyTech. Around the same time, Sega released their first home console in Japan, Taiwan and New Zealand, the SG1000. The system represented Sega's first but important step into home consoles and sold over 2 million units. The SG-1000 is essentially the exact same spec system as the SC-3000 computer and even could be converted to one with a simple keyboard add-on. The SG-1000 also ran BASIC. The same Sega and home cartridges from MyTech were compatible here as well. Nintendo was also experimenting with the BASIC programming language on the Famicom. Known as Family BASIC, it was developed by Hudson and Sharp and released in 1984. But as Sega and Nintendo entered the console wars with the 16-bit era, it meant closing off their systems and imposing strict licensing guidelines for its third parties. Suddenly, there was no place for consoles to allow consumers to develop on the system. This was trench warfare and both companies had a razor-sharp focus to deliver the best games. But when newcomer Sony came along with the PlayStation 1, it had its roots tied to the British bedroom coding era of the early 80s and in 1997, they released the Net Eurose, a consumer-grade development kit hardware that allowed anyone with a PC the ability to write games on the PlayStation 1, albeit with some limitations. This innovation was to kickstart the bedroom coder craze all over again, to connect talented developers with the best hardware around at the time. The downside was that the Net Eurose was somewhat pricey, and you needed to jump through hoops in order to get a hold of the hardware. It also meant you needed to be familiar with the C programming language. So BASIC was a part and parcel of many of the home computers in the 8-bit and 16-bit era. But what about game consoles? What about programming code on a game system for just the average person in their home? Well, we know that the Net Eurose was available for the Sony PlayStation, but that was still quite an expensive amount of money for a like a homebrew development kit but on the Sega Saturn in Japan there was a piece of software that was released by Bits Laboratory known as Game Basic. In 1998 a company known as Bits Laboratory who had previously worked with Sega on Mega CD titles such as Prince of Persia, Rise of the Dragon and Lunar Eternal Blue released Game Basic on the Sega Saturn. Available in Japan only, it's unknown if Game Basic was a response to the Net Eurose, but the price of the hardware certainly came in much cheaper at around 120 US dollars. The Sega Saturn is also a very complex piece of hardware to develop on. Development kits required C or assembly language and took skilled developers to get the very best out of the hardware. Game Basic allows the user to develop their own games. It was also updated and took advantage of the Saturn hardware. In fact, compared to the Net Eurose, you almost had full control of the hardware, including things like light guns, RAM expansions, and other peripherals. It also had full control over the sound chips, the graphics chips, the I.O. chips. You could develop both 2D and 3D games, demos, and much more, all with the basic programming language. The packaging is larger than a standard satin game case. There's a few things going on here. First of all, you get the disc. This of course will boot up the good old blank screen and blinking cursor. Basic is ready for your commands. There's also two manuals that walk you through the language and how to write code. So you're probably wondering, how do you even use Basic on the Sega Saturn? Well, the packaging also comes with a serial cable that plugs one end into the Saturn and the other into a PC. The second disc that comes with Game Basic is Windows software to communicate the Saturn with the PC. 
This is very similar to the Netio Rose, but the main differences here are that you don't need a special version of hardware to run code on. Any retail satin will work. And second, as you type in real time, your code will show up on the satin, essentially acting like a remote terminal. You don't ever push a compiled binary over the wire because this is basic. It's an interpreted language. You're coding directly on the hardware remotely using the serial cable. And this is a very inexpensive way to write games on the Sega Saturn. You're also probably wondering, this is basic, so it's probably slow and it probably sucks. You'd be surprised to learn that Game Basic runs extremely fast code. It's possible to generate stunning 2D and 3D effects with music. It truly opens up the hardware to the hobbyist and makes the Saturn so much more accessible. Like the Netya Rose, there was a small but active community with forums sharing code, tricks and tips and updates on what they were working on. Game Basic became quite popular in Japan, but it did have its limitations. First, you only had around 1 megabyte of the 2 megabyte of RAM available. As this was an interpreted language, there was also no way you could make a standalone game. You'd always need Game Basic to run your code on. But otherwise, you had full access to all fixed and floating point calculations, 3D texture mapping, texture backgrounds, light sources, sprites, hit detection, 32 channel audio with up to 256 songs, and sound effects. This was an impressive piece of software. Game Basic unfortunately was too niche for it to have any real impact. And as it was only available in Japan, meant that it was unknown to the rest of the world. One of the biggest limitations for Game Basic was there was no easy way to just have a standalone game that used Game Basic. You would have to use the software and then load the basic program via the software onto it. So like the Net Your Rose, there wasn't really an easy standalone method to send a game out to a game publisher or a game development house to get recognized. It was really more for the hobbyist, the, the student, the, the tinkerer that was really into you know, basic programming at the time. But there was some still very powerful things that were done. You had access to pretty much everything on the Sega Saturn, all the peripherals, all the hardware, the sound and audio chips, everything was available to you and it was a really cool environment which unfortunately never got recognized outside of Japan and I think it would have been really cool to see something like this released in Europe and North America and opening up the door for Sega Saturn, you know, programmers and bedroom coders and hackers to really get their head around the hardware and see what some of the cool things that they could have done with the system would have been. Well guys, we're going to leave it here for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, you know what to do. Leave me a thumbs up. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe. And I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.